Coming up next on this special literary edition of Arizona Horizon, Jana Boomersbach talks about her new book, a historical novel based on the life of the only woman ever lynched for cattle rustling. And artist and author Bob Bowes Bell tells us how he got his kicks growing up along Route 66. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Author Jenna Boomersbach is out with a new book. This one is a novel and it's based on the life of Ella Watson, a woman lynched for cattle rustling in the Wyoming Territory back in 1889. But Ella Watson was no cattle rustler. Her only mistake was getting on the wrong side of powerful ranchers over land and water rights. On the 125th anniversary of the lynching, Ella Watson's story gets another look in Boomersbach's novel, Cattle Kate. We spoke with Janet Boomersbach about her new work. Good to see Hello. you again. Good I can just call you Janet. I think everyone knows okay. who you are by that first name. <laughs> Good. Um, who was Cattle Kate? There never was a Cattle Kate. Cattle Kate was a fictitious person created by the cattlemen and the Cheyenne Daily newspapers to cover up for a horrible crime. No woman had ever been lynched in the nation as a cattle rustler, and here they had lynched a woman and, and her husband. But they, because she was a, there was a woman lynch, they had to figure out some way to make her so detestable that nobody would care that they had actually killed a woman. And so they created the legend of Cattle Kate, some, that she was a dirty rustler and a filthy whore, and that she was, that she was, this was rangeland justice, and she deserved it, and she was terrible, and she was the queen of the sweet water, and had this huge ra range of, of, of rustling, all of which was fictitious, but for a century history bought that story. Uh, history bought the story because apparently not long after this incident happened, the media, such as it was back in right. those days, very much in line with the power brokers. Very much in line with the power brokers. The only information that ever came out of the territory, this is Wyoming territory, 1889. Mm -hmm. Okay, the only information that ever came out of the territories came from the major dailies in the big city. And in this case, it was Cheyenne, and it was the two major dailies there. And that's what the Associated Press and UPI picked up on and ran stories around the nation and around the world. So the stories that these pa papers were feeding them were the, on the, the only version of the story they ever got. Now, interestingly, we've discovered that all of the frontier papers in the small, smaller towns were trying to tell the true story, but nobody was paying attention to them. So the people in those little towns, they knew what was going on but they had no power to do anything. Plus, the people who had been involved in this lynching, the witnesses and the people who were Ella and Jim's friends, they either died, were murdered, or disappeared. And so people learned very quickly, let's not get our feet in. We don't have a dog in this fight. We've oh. got to stay out of this. Okay, thing. so who was Ella Watson, uh, not Cattle Kate? Not Cattle Kate. And that was the thing that, that I was after, is who was this woman who was branded this way? And her name was Ella Watson. She was 29. She was a homesteader, one of the few female homesteaders in any of the territories in 1889. She had a homestead claim, a legitimate claim of 160 acres along a little creek. She was tried, she wanted to be a citizen. She had applied for citizenship because she was Canadian born. Mm. She had originally immigrated to Kansas with her family and then came west by herself. And that was another clue about what kind of woman this was because most women went west with their husbands, their fathers, or their brothers. She went west by herself. And, created this her, her own her own life worked for a while at a, at a major hotel in, in little Rollins Wyoming territory mm -hmm. then met this Jim Averill man who she would eventually marry and and got the claim he had a claim next to hers she got a branding iron um, by by hook and crook because the cattleman who controlled the branding irons didn't want her to have one but she figured out a way to get one um, she had cattle that she had bought and that she was keeping in a corral. She was trying to be a citizen. She was raising a young boy. She, she really had, was creating a life. Um, and that's the woman that I discovered that I found so amazing. At first I thought I was just going to write about a great injustice, but I wasn't writing about an injustice. I was writing about a true life woman who was one of those strong Western pioneer women that uh, history has basically ignored. Now, she was a strong Western pioneering woman who got these 160 acres, right. and again, she wasn't married, so they could get the 160 acres for him and then combine them when they married, correct? Well, after they were proved up. If they married, it would go, still go to the man. The way the, the laws were written, it was the head of household could have the, the claim. So if she married this man publicly, yes. then, then she, he would take the land. It would be his land. And she wanted her own land, so they fate, so they went away and got secretly married, but didn't tell anybody. They thought, oh, well, I after see, we're I all see. proved up, after okay. five years, when this is my legal land, then we can tell people that we're married. But that land 
is the, the, the sticking point here as the far as this. Talk point. to me about these, who this A.J. Bothwell was. A.J. Bothwell was the neighbor next door. He was the guy who was, he thought he was the king of the Sweetwater Valley. He thought he was just the best guy in the world. He could do whatever he wanted to do. I mean, this guy was notorious for breaking the law at any, at any, given, at any given time. I mean, he would put up fences where there couldn't be fences. He would claim land that he had no right to. I mean, he just thought he owned the world. And when little Ella puts her little claim down there on Horse Creek, that was land that he had used as a pasture land. And in fact, it was the land that he used to get to the creek. So all of a sudden, she and J her husband own the, the, the right to the creek. And this guy is like getting like, where's my water coming from? I need that water. I need that water. So he tries to scare them out. He tries to burn them out. He tries to, um, he tries to romance her out of her land. He, he tries to be sweet and said, listen, honey, why don't I just pay off the, the you know, I'll buy the land outright for you and then you can pay me back. And you know, I, he tried every scam he could think of. And when he couldn't find any scams to get her off the land, he murdered her. Well, okay, he murders her, but how does he justify that? I, I, I imagine there had, obviously there was a story that she rustled cattle. How did they work that out? They just declared it. They said, well, she's a cattle rustler and we, we need to take care of these rustlers because boy, we're, we're getting rustled to death. You know, this, this whole, we can't, we can't, the judges won't, won't uh, convict people who are rustlers and those homesteaders are all moving in. And, and the thing was that the, the cattlemen were making up these incredible rustling stories because the cattle industry was dying and they were losing, cat, they were losing lots of money and their investors back east, they wanted to know why they were losing money. Well, we're being rustled to death. Being so a lot of what their claim of the great rustling of the Western cattle was fictitious itself. But they used that excuse that she was a rustler. Um, they hated the homesteaders. This was a time when, when, the, when the open range of the cattlemen is disappearing and the, and the homesteaders are moving in with their little plots of land, right? right. And breaking up the, the big expanses of land that they needed for their cattle to run all over the place and eat free, right? So that, that whole conflict... Um, uh, um, Ella and Jim are right in the middle of that whole conflict. And they wind up lynched, and they we wind up hearing the story from the cattleman's side for a long time. Only from that time. side. Okay. So, um, what happened to that land? Did Bothwell get it? Yes. So the bad yes. guy won? Yes. The bad guy won. He stayed in that valley for the next 26 years. He took over their property. He used Ella's house that she had built as his ice house. He became the postmaster instead of the man he had just lynched, who was the postmaster for at a little roadhouse. He took over that job. That, and, and he never once ever showed any remorse for what had happened. Most of the other, there were six lynchers, <clears throat> and most of the other ones moved away because they were so chagrined at how the public you know, treated them because they were, they, were, they were absolutely shunned. And they were, the public reacted to these murders by, you know, by, by calling them names and, and being mean and, you know, and, yeah. and, and trying to disgrace them. Except him, he didn't care any of that. He just carried on his own way. Okay, so you're doing research on this. You're right. obviously up in Wyoming for at least a spell here. Um, how do they look at this story now in Wyoming? And are there Bothwells still roaming the earth who aren't too happy about you resurrecting this story? <laughs> well, Bothwell himself would eventually die in LA and I don't know if there's any Bothwells around but there are people around in that valley who in fact were part of this whole lynching situation and they don't like this story at all <clears throat> they would like to believe that she really was a rustler and that she really was a bad person and that there was some justification but virtually every historian who's now looked at this case and there are plenty from from Wyoming itself and that's where you look you look to the people who really understand that culture you look at people who really who live there who have a stake there you know they do have a dog in this fight yes. You know, they want to know what really happened. And there are still those in Wyoming who want to believe that Ella Watson was a terrible woman and she deserved what she got. But almost every historian there that living now um, is saying to them, this was a total a horrible miscarriage of justice. You know, hearing the story, I think of incident at Owl Creek, Owl Creek Bridge. I think of uh, Michael Cimino's film, that big bomb that these peak characters were in. The, the story has been out there in so many different ways. You now have taken the story and written it as a novel. As Why a novel? a novel? Because I wanted Ella to tell her story. I mean, the way this whole thing happened is I had known about this story because I was writing for, I write for True West magazine, as you know. And so I had been writing about women of the West and one of the profiles I did when I realized that there were some problems with the, with the way this history had told the story was about Ella Watson. And ever since then, I have been wanting to know more and more and more about it. And I was reading a historical novel on my mother's patio in 2009, and all of a sudden I thought I heard the words, I never thought I'd die like that. 
And I went, oh my God, that's yeah. what Ella would have said. Yeah. I thought, she needs to tell this story. This needs to be, she's the person that they erased. This is a personality, this is the person, the human blood person that was erased. She needs to be able to stand up straight and tall and tell her story what happened to her. And, and it, so it seemed to me that t doing it as a historical novel would give me a chance to, to, to um, bring life and breath to this legend. So, and you've written, you've written books, obviously, uh, when you were with Judd, you've written the nonfiction books, now you've got this novel, Compare and Contrast. I love the historical novel. Yeah, yeah. I do because it satisfies my journalistic credentials for all the research. And what I did in this book is that it, this is really in three parts. The first part, Ella tells her story. Second part is the third person as you see how they create the legend. And the third part is the facts of the matter where every chapter there's end notes that tell you what happened, the real story, mm. uh, and chapter and verse of where I got information from. So you can track this, the, his, the accuracy and the historical truth of this whole story. So that part of my journalistic thing is satisfied with that, but being able to bring breath and, and life to these characters so that you're not just reading facts and figures Figures, but you're, you're letting these people become personalities and, and you deduce what you can from the evidence you can find. And yet, and this is my last question here, as far as, you know, a lot of novel writers, fiction writers will say, the character surprised me. The character's doing things I didn't expect. <laughs> how, can you, how can you have her surprise you? You know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. And from the very beginning of the book, you know what's going to happen. You know that this yeah. woman is going to be lynched. And the, the fact the book starts off as she has a rope around her neck, right? And, yes. it, and she starts talking about, well, this can't be happening. How, how can I be hanged? This is, this is wrong, right? And then you go through her life. The thing that was so amazing, I, I love the line when you said 125 years of her anniversary of her murder, now we get to hear her story. Well, I wrote that, a sentence like that in a promotion piece I did, and then I put period, I was going to be done. And then my fingers typed, and if Ella could, she would have said, it's about time. Well, it is about time. Great effort. Congratulations on thank this, you. and thank you so much for stopping by. We appreciate thank you. it. Artist, historian, magazine owner, radio personality. Before Bob Bowes Bell was any of those things, he was a kid growing up in Kingman, Arizona, along the iconic Route 66. Bell's written and illustrated a new book, The 66 Kid Raised on the Mother Road. We spoke with Bob Bowes Bell about his effort. How you been? I've been good. This book is absolutely fascinating. And Thank you. And for you, this is your life, Bob Bozbell. It is. Why, why, why'd you go through some? This would be difficult, I think, for anyone to go. This is everything about you as a kid. Well, the good the stuff we can print. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when I um, turned 66, I thought if I'm ever going to do a book on growing up on Route 66, I, I guess I better do it this year. And I, like most people, I thought, oh, this will be fun. It'll be easy and stuff. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life because you, really, you want to be honest. And uh, sometimes that's really difficult. You're talking about your parents, talking about yourself, talking yeah. about your hometown. Nothing's perfect. But my feeling was if I don't tell the truth and there isn't a floor, then you can't have a ceiling. And so that's what guided me. So is this an autobiography? Is it a narrative history? What is it? Well, it's a little bit of everything, uh, kind of like me. <laughs> it's got a little bit of a cartoonist, uh, a little bit of a memoir, a little bit of a, a love letter to my hometown. Um, it's a uh, history lesson about uh, Route 66 because I didn't see it when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I uh, was into the Old West and my, I would go and buy True West magazine and nothing ever happened in Kingman. And I thought it was the dumbest place on earth. And I remember looking out at my dad's gas station sitting in the office and reading True West and looking up and going, the only thing that happens here is the wind blows 24 hours a day. And I can't wait to get out of here because no history happened here. Oh, my goodness. And now you're of age where you go, a whole lot of history happens, especially along route. Before we get to Route 66, though, yeah. describe uh, what it was like growing up. In, it sounds like Kingman was a little bit of Mayberry. Well, a little bit of Mayberry, a little bit of Death Valley. I mean, <laughs> it was, we were so isolated. I, I think about it today. Uh, it was a dirt road from Kingman to Phoenix. Hmm. And the reason for that is that uh, merchants in Prescott didn't want us to go that way. They wanted us to drive to Ash Fork on 66 and come down and go through the Black Canyon. And so it was a dirt road. There was no TV, okay? There was uh, one radio station that didn't like rock and roll. And so we had to listen to KOMA in Oklahoma City uh, for 15 minutes at night. Yeah. It, it was <laughs> <laughs> Sure, sure. And uh, so things were special. 
because of that. But it's it, but in reading the book and looking at the book, because you look at the book as much as you read it, right. uh, it sounded like a little Norman Rockwell action. Your your little everything your little league team did got in the paper. Yes. I mean, you, it, it again. That, it, it sounds almost idyllic in its way. You know, looking back it was, and of course at the time we thought we were deprived and we didn't have any of the latest songs and we didn't, and you know, our, our fashion was out and stuff like that. But looking back, it really was amazing. And you mentioned Little League, and I am stunned that the adults, they built a Little League field. Now, it wasn't pre-constructed or brought or anything, I think. They went and carved out of the desert a Little League field, and these are parents and they all had day jobs and uh, my little league coach was a highway patrolman and somebody else you know had uh, worked at the air base sure. and they uh, would get off work early and they'd come and they'd teach us how to play baseball and then they would give over the thursday night and the friday night and the saturday night to coach us at little league games now that's amazing that is truly amazing and it's not like they could stay home and watch tv no because we didn't have it <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to get to okay so earliest memory of route 66. i was uh my parents were, were westbound on Route 66 and near the Painted Desert. And I remember standing on the transmission hump and looking out and I saw a something rippling on the horizon and it was distorted and it was floating in the air. And then all of a sudden we got closer and it turned into a car and it blasted past us. And wow. that was the, the my first memory. That sounds almost like a Coen Brothers film. I mean, <laughs> coming down Someday it will be. Yeah, it, it will be a Coen Brothers. Um, what did Route 66 mean to you, though, when you were growing up? Was it the same as Kingman? You couldn't quite see the attraction? Well, like I said, I didn't see the history. My dad had Al Bell's Flying A. My mother worked at the highway department uh, and they're doing the roads and stuff. She was a secretary. And then in, during the summers, uh, when I got older, I worked for the highway department. So we all made our living from the road, but I couldn't see the history of it. You know what I mean? I, I, sure. I couldn't see it. And then later, a writer called me and he said, I saw your article on your dad's gas station in Arizona Highways, and I want to interview you. And I said, oh, okay, fine. And uh, he goes, uh, his first question was, what was it like growing up in such a historic place. And I said it was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? What kind of I, I couldn't see it. Yeah. I, was, I was looking right at history. You write that you are confounded and irritated. I was, by it. because to me it was just another road, you know. We made a living on it. We drove to Little League games on it. We drove home from school on it. What was the big deal? It was just asphalt, and it wasn't very wide. It was really about as wide as this table. You know, it was a very, very narrow piece of, uh, of uh, structure. But it sounds like you are in Europe. And you had an experience in Europe that kind of reminded you that Route 66 really was a big deal. It took me going to Spain. I was 5,000 miles from home. My wife was working for the Department of Defense, and she invited me to come over. And I was looking for Cowboy Ground Zero. I, f I figured if I could find where the conquistadors emanated from, I could find where the cowboy came from. And so I was in western Spain, and it's called Extremadura, and I found uh, uh, a small town there that I thought was Cowboy Ground Zero. A day later, we were in Rota, Spain, which is on the beach, and there's a sign there, and it said, this is where Columbus set sail on his second journey to the New World. And so I stood on that beach, and I looked out there, and I thought, oh, man, you couldn't pay me to go out there in a modern-day <laughs> boat. Those guys were so amazing. That's so brave. And then I got ready to leave, and I turned around, and on the beach, I saw the Route 66 bar. Oh, my and goodness. And I went, Yeah. what goes around comes around. They, they sent cattle and horses to us. And you know what? We gave them a road back. Yeah. And everywhere I went in Spain, they have a magazine, real popular magazine. It's called Ruta 66. And you'll see magnets in the store that say Route 66. It's a big deal. So it's a big deal now. And obviously, and that, it's, it sounds like that was kind of an inspiration for the book. I know your father was an inspiration for the book as yeah. well. And uh, a health incident was an inspiration for the book. And again, did this happen near Route 66? Oh, yes. Uh, my best friend, Charlie Waters, said, I want to get the band back together. And we were called the Exits because... High school band? We were in high school. Uh, we were freshman in high school. And how do you meet girls? you got to have a rock band, okay? Surf music was all the go. And so we had to have a name. And Charlie said, why don't we call ourselves the Exits because that's where everybody's going to go when they hear us play. And so we became the Exits. And uh, we were playing all over the place. And so uh, in college, we drifted apart and went our separate ways. And about five years ago, uh, Charlie called me and he said, I have a bucket list and I want to get the band back together one more time. And I want to play where we, the first job we did. And that's the Elks Lodge in downtown Kingman. 
So I set it up. We were there. We were practicing, and we were doing, and I'm not making this up, wipeout, and I had a heart attack. During wipeout? During wipeout. And I don't remember. Uh, I, remember <laughs> I remember the first part, but I don't remember the second part. And they saved my life in Kingman. Uh, well, two of the band members had just taken CPR. Oh, my. And what are the odds mm. that a rock and roller would know uh, CPR? And every 10 minutes you're out, you lose 10% of your brain. And they, they, those two guys, Wayne Rutschman and Terry Mitchell, saved my life. The paramedics came, and they saved my life at the Kingman Regional Hospital. And we went back the next year to do the real gig, and we raised twenty thousand dollars for defibrillators in Kingman. So, I mean, literally, I mean, your life. I mean, Route sixty six is you. I yes, mean, it yeah. really is. With that in mind, from Alpha to Omega, practically, um, would you be Bob Bo's Bell on this set? wearing a cowboy hat with an impressive artistic career. You got the magazine, you got the whole. Would you be Bob Bo's Bell if you were born and raised in Flagstaff or Mesa or Tucson? No, I would be, but I, would, uh, I wouldn't be wearing the cowboy hat. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't but know how to answer that. But yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Every and that's true of everybody. You know, we we don't realize that these little things add up to. Do you see that though? Do you yeah. look? I mean, you've looked back more than most people have with this yeah. book at your life. And the book forced me to do that. Yeah. Do you see that though? You say, well, this. My goodness, this is why I did X. This is why I did Y. I one of the most profound things to me was uh, my father was uh, from a farming background from Iowa. And he was drafted in World War II, and the uh, troop train dropped him off in downtown Kingman on his 21st birthday. He's coming down the middle of the street in August, and he says, and I quote, I will never come back to this hellhole. And it's his, his birthday. And uh, he's one of 10,000 GIs at the Kingman Air Base, and there's 500 available women. Okay, and my mother's one of them, and she's dating captains and lieutenants, and she picks a buck private from, <laughs> from Thompson, Iowa, and they get married. And so I have relatives on my fa uh, father's side, they're all farmers. And then we moved to Kingman when I'm nine years old, and all of a sudden there's all these outlaws. These are cowboys, man. They come blasting into the house at Christmas time, smoking and kicking things and yelling. <laughs> and my eyes are as big as saucers. And so uh, one of the chapters in the book is related to outlaws mm -hmm. because my grandmother told uh, about how we were related to John Wesley Harden, Bigfoot Wallace, and Black Jack Ketchum. And my mom hated it because I'd say, we're, hey, we're related to outlaws. She'd go, no, 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 don't say that. Please don't say that. Because what she heard was we're related to uh, the Boston Strangler, Jack the Ripper, <laughs> and Charlie Manson. <laughs> sure. And you also write that it's okay to say that my grandfather was an outlaw, but if your father even walked or had a jaywalking ticket, you can't, that's a, don't say anything A typical that. Westerner will punch you in the mouth if you call his daddy a crook, but he'll brag a little when he's telling about his grandpa being an outlaw. Isn't that something? Do you think, conversely, do you think you missed out? on anything being raised in Kingman. You know, I thought that for a long time because I went through this phase where I thought Kingman was dumb, like I said, and I, and I became a teenager and I really thought it was stupid and I couldn't wait. And I, I wish we were in California. But I witnessed so many things that I'm so glad that I that I, that I grew up there. We had uh, Native Americans, uh, Wallapais, uh, Mojaves, and um, Havasupai. Uh, Indians went to my school and so we'd come down to the valley to play baseball and on the mound would be Filbert Wadahamaji, Havasupai, and the catcher was Nay Nish and he was a Wallapai and they wouldn't do signals they would just go <laughs> yup, dum, hit, ya, hum, and, and <laughs> saying you know this guy can't hit a curve you know and the, the batters I remember we were at Peoria and the batter would step out of the box and he'd look at the umpire and go can they do that? You know, well, I don't think I'd have got that if I'd have grown up in, in Laguna Beach. Oh, no. I mean, it's, it's, again, you read this and you look at this, and I did see a little maybe, I did see a little Norman Rockwell there, maybe a little tilted Norman Rockwell, yeah. but Norman Rockwell, nonetheless, when you go back, if you go, I don't know how often you go back up there, but if, if and when you go back, do you look, I know your dad's uh, original gas station on the, is it only on a reservation in Peach Springs? Long gone, right? Long gone, you can't, it's hard to find the foundation. Is, are, are other things long, is, is it, uh, are things pretty much intact there? How's it look to you? Every time I go back, I was just there, uh, Charlie Waters, my best friend, just passed away. And so I was there for the memorial service. Every time I go back, something else is fading or gone. And I finally realized that when I was a kid, the Old West was 50 years in the past. Yeah. And we would go out into these ghost towns, White Hills, Signal, Gold Road, Oatman, and uh, these places were falling over and then they'd be gone. 
And now I realize we're 50 years from when I was growing up and all the Route 66 stuff is fading the same way. So basically, uh, you've got uh, you know the generational shift here. Your book is, is obviously uh, much focused on you as a young guy. Yeah. You can do a follow-up on the, 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 the crazy years, the new times and the KSLX and all that kind of business? Because you touch on it in the book, but yeah. uh, is, is there another uh, graphic autobiography slash narrative history ready to go? Well, let's put it this way. I wouldn't be able to dedicate that one to my grandson. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was a rock and roll drummer and an underground cartoonist. Yeah, well, you there were. Yes, yeah, you were. Yeah, yes, I uh, were. Yeah. So what are you doing these days? What are you, what's going on with you? Well, we're doing a lot of stuff out at True West. Uh, we, uh, I just was the artist in residence in Lincoln, New Mexico. There's a whole bunch of things breaking on the Billy the Kid story. And uh, I'm looking at start doing my next book, which is probably going to be more of a graphic novel on Mickey Free. Wow, interesting. Well, congratulations on this book. It's, it's almost like a yearbook, the way it, it's, it's graphic, it's big, lots of pictures, which I like. But, yeah. but it just sounds like it must have been a hoot to do. I mean, difficult, but a hoot to do. It was. It was very rewarding. Well, congratulations on this. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us on this special literary edition of Arizona Horizon. You have a great evening. If you have comments about Arizona Horizon, please contact us at one of the addresses on your screen. Your comments may be used on a future edition of Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.